Thank you for that, Bob. It's a bit warm, isn't it? If I, uh, if I suddenly start melting, don't be surprised. So, come on, grow up. Has anybody said that to you this week? If so, why? Parents often tell their kids to grow up when they become frustrated and start crying about something they should have been able to do themselves, don't they? Like fasten their shoelaces or zip up their jacket. Parents regularly tell their children to grow up because they want them to become independent. They don't want their kids to turn into 30-year-olds who still need mummy and daddy to go with them to a job interview or even still live at home, maybe. Now, while we expect our children to become more independent and run to, us as, run to us parents less and less for help as they mature, God wants just the opposite from his children. A mature child of God is not someone who runs less to God. A mature Christian runs to God more. So today, God's telling us to grow up. And when we do this, when we, we, will, when we, do, when we do this, when we cry more, we rely more. If our passage today were to be made into a music video, and remember, I'm not Martin, so I can't do this, but if it was, a psalm is after all a song, the opening scene would be dark room, cue smoke machine, imagine that, smoke machine, with a person huddled in the corner. I should lose my place again. In the corner, crying. And the camera zooms in on this individual and the verses of Psalm 130 would crescendo into the opening verses. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing. The other important point about this psalm is waiting. Well, no one likes to wait, do they? Yet life is full of waiting, isn't it? Waiting for an email or a WhatsApp reply or a letter. Remember those? Waiting on answers to your questions. Waiting in traffic. How much time do we spend waiting in traffic? Waiting for the end of your working day. Waiting for medical results. Waiting. As I said, Psalm 130 is a psalm about waiting. But it's also one of the psalms of trust. And yet it almost begins as a psalm of trouble. The psalmist is crying out to the Lord from a place of deep pain and distress. Last week with Jim, we looked at Psalm 129, which was all about persevering through pain. Now we come to Psalm 130 which is all about waiting on the Lord. But the focus is not on waiting through the pain, it's about waiting in hope, which is what, what makes it one of the Psalms of trust. Psalm 130 has a simple yet profound message for us today. Those who wait on the Lord, wait in hope. We don't wait in desperation, desperation or despair, we wait in hope. Psalm 130 is a part of a group of Psalms called the Psalms of Ascent, from Psalm 120 to 134, which we looked at last year, and we started to look at last year, we picked up again last week. The pilgrims travelling to Jerusalem sang these songs as they went up to the city for the great Jewish festivals. And as such, not, these songs not, not only were for worship as they walked, but also they prepared their hearts for the corporate worship that they would engage in at the temple. As Christians, our festival of corporate worship is the Lord's Supper. So we should approach that being aware of our great need for forgiveness so that we partake with thankful, reverent hearts to our gracious God who sent his son to pay the penalty for our sins that we deserved. This psalm of ascent takes us from the depths of guilt and despair to the heights of joyous hope in the Lord. And it tells us no matter how deep we are in guilt and despair, we can cry out to God for forgiveness, knowing that he delights in, our abundant, in abundant redemption. And I've just realised I've not turned the clicker on. And I'm clicking. Somebody's clicked for me, have they? Sorry. There are four parts of two verses each. The first part is on the screen now. We can cry out to the Lord for mercy from the depths of guilt and despair. That's in verses 1 and 2. Let's look at each verse separately. To cry out for mercy, we must understand the depths of our guilt. That's verse 1. The first thing that strikes you about this verse is that the psalmist was no doubt a godly man. After all, God inspired him to write this psalm. While he could be writing about his earliest experience of God's forgiveness when he came to faith, or a later time when he fell into some sin, even so as a Jewish young man growing up with the instructions in the Torah, we can't imagine that he was the most, what we would call, terrible sinner. 
Yet he viewed himself as being in the depths. And that reminds us of Jonah crying out to God from the belly of the great fish after his disobedience to God's commission to go to Nineveh. That's in Jonah 2 verses 1 to 9. John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, was a godless drunken sailor before his conversion who had literally fallen into the depths of the ocean and barely escaped death. His autobiography was appropriately titled Out of the Depths. The lesson is, whether at the point of conversion or afterwards, those who have truly, truly come to know God also know something of the depths of their sin and guilt. Isaiah the prophet was surely a godly man before he had his vision of the Lord, but instantly when he saw God on his throne with the seraphim crying out, in Isaiah 6 verse 3, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. In Isaiah 6 verse 5 he said, Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. My, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. At that moment, Isaiah was in the depths. C.S. Lewis, the author of the Chronicles of Narnia books, wrote in his book, Mere Christianity, when a man is getting better, he understands more and more, more and more clearly, the evil that is still in him. When a man is getting worse, he understands his own badness less and less. So whether you haven't yet come to faith in Christ, or whether you've been a Christian for a long time, getting a glimpse of God in his holiness will plunge you into the depths of guilt and despair, so that you cry out to him for mercy. But no matter how low we get we can still cry out zealously to the Lord, verse 2 tells us. The intensity of the psalmist's cry can be seen in that he uses the divine name of God eight times in these eight verses. He tends to alternate between Yahweh, printed as Lord, all capitalized, the covenant name of the Lord, that emphasizes his faithfulness to his promises, and Adonai, printed as capital L, Lord, which emphasizes his sovereign lordship and thus his ability to fulfill his promises. His repeated appeal for God to hear his voice and for his ears to be attentive reflects his awareness that God is on high while he is in the depths of sin and guilt. There is a huge gulf between them which self-help cannot answer. So he cries out fervently to God. Charles Spurgeon, the well-known Victorian Baptist minister, wrote, It matters little where we are if we can pray, but prayer is never more real and acceptable than when it rises out of the worst places. Deep places beget deep devotion. Spurgeon cites James Vaughan who says, everyone prays, but very few cry. But those who do cry to God, the majority would say, I owe it to the depths, I learned it there. If you want some context on this, talk to my wife Kay. There have been some days when she's cried out to God in prayer from the depths of her illness and disability. So even if you have done something awful that overwhelms you with guilt and despair, you can cry out to the Lord for mercy. God's forgiveness leads to fear because without it we're done. That's verses 3 and 4. The statement of verse 3 raises the question, doesn't God keep a record of our iniquities? The answer is, yes he does. Matthew 12, 36 tells us that. He doesn't suffer from amnesia but the psalmist means, if the Lord were to add up all my sins and hold me accountable for them, I'm done. I don't stand a chance. So, without God's forgiveness, we're done, verse 3. Often, those who don't know God assume everything will be okay on the day of judgment because, basically, I'm a good person. But add up the list of your sins just for the past month, let alone your lifetime. Include every wrong thought and deed. Remember to add up all the direct commands of God that you've broken, plus all those that you have ignored or failed to get around to doing. I mentioned some of the following commandments last week in my call to worship. But have you, ever, have you loved God with all your heart, soul and mind all the time? Have you loved your neighbour, especially your immediate family, as yourself, with no hint of selfishness or anger? Have you immediately cut short every prideful, lustful, or greedy thought? Have you been faithful in prayer and in studying God's word? I could keep going, but you probably won't let me. <laughs> if you add up all your sins from just for the past month, you wouldn't stand a chance if you stood for judgment before the holy God. 
and he knows everything you've done or not done, not only for the past month, but your entire lifetime. Without God's forgiveness, we're doomed. But the good news of the next verse is, there is forgiveness with God, and it should lead to fear. That's verse 4. The but of verse 4 is one of the great contrasts of Scripture. Don't miss the crucial declaration, but with you there is forgiveness. This is, this is comparable to Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5, where Paul, after telling how we're all dead in our sins, rise. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Here, verse 4 tells us, without forgiveness, you're doomed. But with it, you learn to fear God. At first glance, this verse seems strange. You might expect it to read, but there is forgiveness with you, that you may be loved, or that there is justice with you, that you may be feared. So why does the psalm say, psalmist say it that way? As Spurgeon again put it, you stand before God convicted and condemned with the rope around your neck and God pardons your sins. Then you weep for joy and hate the evil which of which you've been forgiven and live to honour the Redeemer by whose blood you've been cleansed. You fear God because you know that he had every reason to condemn you, but he did not. You don't fear his punishment now but you do fear him because you know that he could have rightly cast your body and soul into hell for all eternity. His forgiveness does not make you flippant about your sin. So the psalmist tells us that no matter how deep you may be in guilt and despair, you can cry out to the Lord for mercy. And he adds that there is forgiveness with God and it leads to fear because without it we're doomed. The next point is experiencing God's forgiveness makes us wait and hope for God himself. That's verses 5 and 6. The translators here have added an extra more than. In the original Hebrew text, with more forceful poetry, it's simply more than the watchman for the morning. The watchman for the morning. There are three questions to answer in these verses. What do we wait for? Well, we wait for God himself. The psalmist isn't waiting for forgiveness because he's already got that in verse 4. Forgiveness isn't a feeling but a fact we obtain by faith. But sin always strains our fellowship and sense of closeness with God. So the psalmist is waiting on God for that sense of his presence. He's waiting and hoping for the intimacy with God that he used to know. He wants God's assurance that he is his child. Someone has pointed out four reasons why God often makes us wait on him. First, waiting exercises our patience of faith. Second, it gives us time for preparation for the coming gift that we're seeking. Third, it makes the blessing sweeter when it arrives. And fourth, it shows the sovereignty of God to give when and as he pleases. This causes us to submit to his sovereignty, acknowledging that he alone is God. What is the basis of our hope? We hope in God's word of promise. And in, this, and in his word I put my hope. He says in the verses, Matthew Henry observes, we must hope for that which we must hope for that only which he has promised in his word and not for creatures of our own fancy and imagination. We must hope for it because he has promised it and not from any opinion of our own merit. God is merciful and has redeemed us. So we hope in his promises. How should we wait and hope? We should wait and hope expectantly and confidently. The, anal the analogy of the watchman waiting for the morning is repeated to make us stop and think about it. The main idea is we should wait expectantly and with certainty. If you've ever stood night watch in the military, which I haven't, obviously, I understand that you look forward to the morning when you're relieved of your duty. I imagine it's very similar working a night shift. The night often drags on slowly. Because you're, and because you're tired, you aren't allowed to sleep on duty. But you know one thing for certain. Morning will come. It's never failed. That's how we should wait and hope for the renewed sense of the Lord's presence after we've experienced his forgiveness. It will come. Just be faithful and eagerly waiting for him. But the psalmist doesn't stop there. Having been in the depths of guilt and despair, 
<coughs> excuse me, and then experiencing God's forgiveness, he knows that others are also where he was. They need God's forgiveness. So he concludes, experiencing God's forgiveness makes us long for others to experience his abundant redemption. Verses 7 and 8. When you've been in the depths, then you've been washed with God's forgiveness. You want others to experience the same thing. The psalmist's basis for hoping in the Lord is that with him there is loving kindness. He is not mean and gruff, but loving and merciful. Do you recall how he revealed to himself he revealed himself to Moses in Exodus thirty four, who asked to see his face? And he said in verse six, and he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And David, who cites that text in Psalm 103, verse 8, adds in Psalm 103, verse 13, As the Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And our psalmist also adds, And with him is full redemption. Not just redemption, full redemption. The English Bible translator Coverdale translated it so much better. I'm guessing Bob would prefer this quote, actually, it being from the King James Version. Plenteous or abundant redemption. Or as John Bunyan titled his autobiography, there is grace abounding to the chief of sinners. No matter how great your sin, his redemption is, re sorry, his redemption is abundant with plenty to spare, plenty to spare. It covers all your sins. He will redeem Israel from all their sins. The psalmist didn't know exactly how God would do this, but that when Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, heard that his son would be the forerunner to the Messiah, that Mary was with the child, sorry, that Mary was with, with the child, the Saviour, through the Holy Spirit, he prophesied in Luke 1 verse 68, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and redeemed his people. With the blood of Jesus, with his blood, Jesus accomplished our redemption out of the slave market of sin. In conclusion, do you know that he has redeemed you from sins, all your sins? Do you know? You can. There is forgiveness with the Lord. It is said by Charles Spurgeon on the night before the 1st of August, 1830, now known as Emancipation Day of Britain's colonies in the West Indies, the slaves there never went to bed. They stayed awake because at daybreak they would be set free from their slavery. Tens of thousands of them went to their places of worship and spent the night singing praises to God, waiting for the first glimmer of daylight. And just before dawn, some of them went to the tops of the hills so they could signal others that the day had broken. Out of the depths of the horrors of slavery, when the daylight came, they would taste the joys of freedom. After the emancipation in the USA, of the slaves in the USA, the word spread down from Capitol Hill into the valleys of Virginia and to the Carolinas and into the plantations of Georgia, Mississippi and Alabama. The newspaper headlines read, Slavery Legally Abolished. However, many slaves in the South went right on living like they had been never set free. In fact, one Alabama slave was asked what he thought of the Emancipation Proclamation. He replied, I don't know nothing about Abraham Lincoln except to say that he set us free. And I don't know nothing about that either. How tragic. A war was fought. Legislation had been signed. Slaves were free. And yet many continued to live out their years without knowing anything about it. They had chosen to remain slaves and kept serving the same master throughout their lives. So it is with many believers today. They have been set free. And yet they have chosen to remain slaves to the same strongholds that have gripped them all their life. Let's make sure that's not us. When Jesus, the sunrise from on high, visits you with God's tender mercy, you will know the unspeakable joy that comes from having his abundant redemption applied to your soul. Your sins and lawless deeds he remembers no more. Fear him. Love him. And praise him. Amen. Shall we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. 
Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus to pay the shocking price for our sins, his own lifeblood shed for us. Thank you that in him we have forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. We offer this prayer to you in the name of Jesus, our God and Saviour. Amen.